Okay, I think we'll get started. We've hit 111 participants. That seems like a nice number to start on. Um, so let's get started. First, welcome everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, we have what I think is a really exciting lineup today of esteemed researchers presenting really novel research programs. Um, I am Drew McCarter. I'm the executive director of the nonprofit organization Pure Earth. We are a New York-based NGO that works in low and middle income countries to identify and prevent and mitigate exposure to toxic chemicals. Um, and in particular, we work presently mostly on lead and mercury, um, overwhelmingly lead at the moment. Um, before we jump into our presentations, a couple of notes. Um, there is a Q&A box at the bottom of your Zoom screen. That's where we will collect questions. We will answer some of these questions live in that box uh, written by you know, written answers. After each presentation section, we'll also have a live Q&A where we will pull questions from the Q&A box and the presenters will have a chance to answer them live. And then at the end of the webinar, we'll have 15 minutes of additional Q&A with all of the presenters. And during these Q&A sessions, we'll be joined um, by Dr. Katie Fellows of the Seattle and King County Hazardous Waste Management Program and Dr. Paramita Hore of the New York City Department of Health and Mental Hygiene, both of whom contributed to some of the work that uh, we'll be presenting today. I want to start by introducing our moderator, Karen Matheson. Karen is currently with the Center for Global Development and is a longtime friend of Pure Earth. She is also a member of our board of directors. Karen is a former senior civil servant who has held a number of esteemed positions across the government. She said that I don't need to list them all, but they include having spent six years uh, heading the Office of Multilateral Development Banks and serving as the acting U.S. Executive Director at the World Bank. Karen's most recent position before CGD was as a senior program officer with the development policy and finance team at the Gates Foundation. Karen, thank you so much for doing this with us. And with that, I think I'll pass it over to you. Drew, cool. thank you so much. It is my, my great pleasure. I'm a big fan of Pure Earth and I'm really excited about today. Um, uh, so we can learn a little bit more about latest research on lead. I think, I think a lot of us have been surprised by the information coming out in the last year and a half or so on the prevalence of lead in, in consumer products. I think we felt like banning lead and gas and paint had pretty much managed the problem. Uh, we learned with uh, Flint, Michigan, it was premature to declare success. And I think uh, we're learning even more now. Um, uh, with respect to lead in consumer products. So we're going to share the latest research on this issue to help us understand the scope and the impact of the lead problem in consumer products. We have three presentations planned um, by our incredible experts. And the first one will look at the prevalence of lead in consumer products in the United States. The second one will take a cross-country look uh, across 25 countries. And then the third one, we'll look at the health impact of lead relative to 15 other chemical pollutants. Um, there will be a brief time for Q&A after the first two presentations, but don't worry if, if you don't get your questions in um, because we will have a longer session at the very end. So I would like to start by turning over the topic to our three expert panelists on the first shoot. Uh, beginning with Katie Porterfield, uh, she's a program manager with Pure Earth and a lead author on the paper called A Snapshot of Lead in Consumer Products Across Four U.S. Jurisdictions. Dr. Adrian Ettinger, who's an adjunct professor, professor at Rutgers School of Public Health, and Dr. Jim Rogers, who is Director of Food Safety and Research and Testing for Consumer Reports. Uh, and then, as Drew said, we will have a couple of other authors joining us for the brief Q&A. So with that, um, Katie, let me turn it over to you. Thanks so much, Karen. Here we go. Hi, everyone. My name is Kate Porterfield, and I am the Research Programs Manager here at Pure Earth. And I am super excited to be able to talk with you today about our recent findings on lead and consumer products in the United States. 
Our recently published paper, A Snapshot of Lead in Consumer Products Across Four U.S. Jurisdictions, was published last week in Environmental Health Perspectives, and I'm here to talk to you today about what we found. To start off with some background, blood lead levels, or BLLs, of children in the United States have declined significantly since the 1970s. This decline is thought to be a result of interventions, especially those focused on gasoline and paint. However, despite these interventions, lead is still a concern for U.S. children. A 2021 study found that 1.9% of U.S. kids have elevated BLLs. These are thought to be a result of household exposures of paint and pipes, commonly referred to as the leading sources of lead exposure in the U.S. However, consumer products are increasingly recognized as a source as well. And these include products like spices, cookware, cosmetics, traditional medicines, toys, jewelry, charms, and candy. As authors, we set out to answer the question of how are these sources contributing to lead poisoning here in the US? To do so, we worked with governments from these four jurisdictions, which conduct in-home investigations for children with elevated BLLs. This means that when a child tests high for blood lead levels, these government's public health officials go into their homes to survey and explore potential service, explore potential sources and determine what's causing the lead poisoning. Data sources from these four jurisdictions spanned 2010 to 2021, and it varied by jurisdiction by availability. To analyze this data, we categorized lead exposure into different categories. The two sources that we were most interested in were housing sources comprised of paint and pipes, and consumer products, which I previously mentioned, include spices, ceramics, metallic cookware, cosmetics, Ayurvedic medicines, toys, jewelry, and candy. We had other sources as well, captured in the other category, which might include take-home exposures, and multiple sources and unknown sources as well. So with that, what did we find? Across all four jurisdictions, consumer products were consistently identified as significant sources of exposure. The lines on this bar graph that I would like to bring attention to are the orange and green, the orange representing housing exposure of paint and pipes, and the green representing consumer products. In 2019, the one year where data was available for all four jurisdictions, we saw that 14 to 64% of cases were attributable to housing-related sources, and 15 to 38% were attributable to consumer products. Sometimes those consumer products even exceeded housing sources, like the case in Oregon. And in New York City, where they have great programs to monitor consumer products, they're still an apparent source of lead exposure. I do wanna note here, as I'm sure you're seeing as well, that New York City has a lot of cases in the multiple sources category. This category comprises of mainly housing and consumer products, which is captured by the orange and green lines in their jurisdiction as well. And you probably have other questions regarding methodology or data specifics by jurisdiction. We really encourage you to check out the paper after this to see some details up close. But the main idea here is that consumer products are consistently found to be nearing the significance of paint and pipes and in some cases, even exceeding them. We were lucky to also have access to temporal data from three of the four jurisdictions. And it shows us that 2019 isn't an outlier. Across multiple years in the three jurisdictions, consumer products were consistently identified as significant sources. In California, during certain years, consumer products outranked housing sources as the main source of exposure. And given that consumer products are increasingly identified as these lead sources, we want to know where they're coming from. We hypothesize that consumer products are likely manufactured internationally and brought to the U.S. through distribution and travel. We conducted a jurisdictional report review as well as a review of U.S. FDA import alerts, which indicated that consumer products found to contain high lead concentrations are more likely to be made in low and middle income countries. This puts immigrant communities at an increased risk, given that they might be unknowingly bringing lead contaminated products into the US through a variety of ways. They could be hand carried during travel. They might be being sent by friends or family members overseas to their new home in the US, or they might be shopping at local ethnic stores in their communities, which are selling some of these imported products. So what is the US doing about this right now? Some states and jurisdictions like the ones here are taking action about consumer products as a source of lead exposure. New York City's Department of Health and Hygiene puts out PSAs like this one here, alerting citizens of potential lead risks. They also monitor New York City storefronts, identifying and removing lead contaminated products and from the shelves to protect consumers on the ground level. 
Recently, Washington state on the right passed two bills which prohibit the sale of lead contaminated cosmetics and uh, consumer, sorry, of cosmetics and cookware across the state. These interventions are great, but they're currently local in scale. On a national level, the FDA has some policies in place, but they're limited in scope. We think that a majority of these products are being hand carried through travel. Like you might've brought something home as a souvenir from a recent trip to Morocco or from Mexico. Because of this, these products that are being either brought from travel or potentially purchased through online distributors like eBay or Etsy cannot be regulated the same as traditionally imported goods. So we need to think outside of the box for how we're approaching these risks. As authors, we call for a few key things. The first is a centralized national data collection system, which systematically tracks data on consumer products tested by childhood lead poisoning prevention programs. This database should be centralized and accessible to all global stakeholders, including researchers, governments, and NGOs who can all use this data to inform future investigations. The second thing that we should do is support primary prevention in the countries of origin where these products are coming from. The best way to prevent lead poisoning is to eliminate it from the source itself. And by systematically tracking surveillance data on consumer products in the US, we can highlight which products or regions we should be focusing our time and resources to. And lastly, we wanna remind everyone that lead poisoning is a global problem that requires a global solution and collaboration between all stakeholders. With that, thank you. And my last slide is not clicking up, but we look forward to your questions later on. Thank you. All right, should we go to our next presenter? Adrian, you're muted. I apologize. Good afternoon, everyone. And thank you to the hosts and, and the attendees uh, for your participation today. I had the honor uh, and privilege to uh, review the paper that you just heard about and write an invited commentary. And so I'm just going to reiterate some of the important points that uh, Katie just made and uh, highlight a few additional ones for your consideration today. Numerous case reports and news bulletins have consistently reported that uh, lead has demonstrated time again to be a potential source of exposure in consumer products. So why aren't we doing more to make sure that consumer products are free of lead? Ever since its first issue in 1936, the Consumer Product Testing and Advocacy Group, Consumer Reports, previously known as Consumer Union, has highlighted dangerous levels of lead in the marketplace. We've heard from cinnamon to applesauce to stainless steel cups and vinyl backpacks. Recent headlines suggest that the lead problem is far from over. A wide variety of consumer products, as you just heard, are increasingly recognized as important sources of potential lead exposure. And with increased globalization involving transnational travel, global commerce, and the cross-cultural exchange of foods and other products, the potential risk of lead exposure from consumer products is real. In the commentary by Porterfield et al, consumer products were consistently identified as one of the main sources of lead exposure in investigations of children with blood lead levels greater than or equal to five micrograms per deciliter. And as you heard, the only identified source of exposure in 15 to 38% of cases. In California and Oregon, consumer products were identified as the sole source of exposure in comparable proportions to housing related sources alone. And in certain years, as you heard, exceeded the housing related sources as the only attributable potential source of exposure. This paper is particularly important because the relative contribution of consumer products to lead exposure risk has not been previously evaluated in comparison to other sources in the home. And in addition, although consumer products have previously been tested for lead content, there has not been such a thorough and comprehensive evaluation of these sources in relation to blood lead levels. Some reports, for example, indicate that certain immigrant and refugee populations are at increased risk for lead-containing products, and others suggest that these are only isolated incidents. But the surveillance study by Porterfield et al. shows the extent to which consumer products are associated 
with actual cases of blood lead levels in children over an extended period of time in four US jurisdictions. There are three main ways that lead gets into consumer products. First, lead has been intentionally added to various products for centuries due to its desirable properties, such as the ability to improve durability, flexibility, and coloring, as well as its purported health benefits in some cultures. Second, lead is inadvertently added as a contaminant during manufacturing, processing, or distribution, particularly in low and middle income countries where environmental lead levels remain high and regulatory controls may be lacking. You'll hear more about that from other speakers later today. And third, lead may be naturally occurring in the raw materials used in production. In the case of certain agricultural products, this may be secondary due to growth in contaminated soil. So what are we doing about lead in consumer products? The main regulatory agencies in the US that deal with lead in consumer products include the Consumer Product Safety Commission that sets limits on lead content for children's products and paint, the US Food and Drug Administration that monitors domestic and imported foods for unsafe levels and develops regulation and guidance to establish maximum levels in food products, the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency that works with the World Health Organization on the global elimination of lead paint. The U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development that requires disclosure of lead paint at property transfer and control of residential paint hazards in federally subsidized properties. And finally, the Occupational Safety and Health Administration, which establishes worker protections for the general industry. In fact, over the past 50 years, regulatory limits on lead content in consumer products have contributed to successful efforts by federal agencies to lower blood lead levels dramatically in the US population. These sustained declines measured by blood and environmental lead levels were achieved through control of lead sources through federal regulations, emissions controls, and applied public health efforts. This graphic shows more than 25 measures that have been taken over several decades since the 1970s when average blood lead levels were 12.8 micrograms per deciliter until the present day when average blood lead levels are less than one microgram per deciliter. Given the overall reduction in environmental and housing related sources of lead over time, the relative contribution of lead in consumer products, however, remains an important consideration. And in fact, hundreds of millions of children globally are exposed to lead. This graph shows children's average blood lead levels by country with darker red colors indicating levels above the World Health Organization's action level of five micrograms per deciliter. This assessment using data from the 2019 edition of the Global Burden of Disease indicates that approximately 815 million children worldwide have blood lead levels above the WHO action level. So how do leaded products still get to consumers? Products, as you heard from Katie, products not intended for distribution in the US may be transported by individuals from other countries or purchased online or repackaged for off-label use and may otherwise avoid inspection or slip through the cracks. Products intended for distribution in the US may not currently be regulated or controlled. And again, products may go uninspected such as when purchased online or for off-label use that may be unintended from the original purpose. And there may be lingering effects from historical production or use such as those found in hazardous waste surrounding former manufacturing sites. So what more can we do? Ensuring products are free of lead is crucial for public health, and there are several steps that can be taken. First, we can increase attention, awareness, and advocacy as we are doing here today. Another way would be in clearer labeling and educating consumers about the risks of lead exposure. Next, we can strengthen laws, regulations, and standards that allow that limit the allowable levels of lead in consumer products and invest in research and innovation to develop alternative materials. And finally, we can implement product testing and certification protocols for lead content before products reach the market. 
enhance monitoring and surveillance efforts, including supply chain management to trace sources of products and help identify non-compliant products and improve enforcement of existing laws. So in conclusion, environmental lead exposure is a global problem with local solutions tailored to relevant sources. However, leading consumers, consumer products is a global problem that requires increased attention and cooperation. A concerted global effort for an integrated and multifaceted approach is needed to address these ongoing challenges. Thank you and for your attention and interest in this important topic. Thank you very much, Adrian. Uh, and for the third part of the presentation, uh, we're going to Dr. Rogers. Hello? Yep, we can yes, hear you. We can Thank hear you. you. And the slides are up? Yes, slides are up. Okay, perfect. Um, thank you for giving me a chance to speak to you on consumer-oriented testing of food for lead. Um, I am speaking from Consumer Reports, um, who's been in the uh, business of testing food, uh, at least under my tenure for about the se last seven and a half years. Um, I was asked to talk about some of the testing that we've done, and I did a, a listing here of baby foods for heavy metals, including lead and arsenic herbs and spices, fruit juices, and uh, some most recent testing of uh, Lunchables, where we detected lead, cadmium, and sodium in, in the products. I want to give you a perspective from the consumer because we believe that the consumer will be the ones that will help us address this problem of getting these uh, contaminated foods off the market by various ways. At Consumer Reports, we primarily do it by testing our advocacy work and our journalism work. And so I'm gonna give you uh, at least two examples of some of our testing and some of the results, some concrete results that we've seen um, as a result. So the chocolate test and retest is, is called that because we initially tested uh, dark chocolate bars and the testing was the resulting story was so popular, we decided to retest uh, an increased number of chocolate uh, products. The seven categories you see here included cocoa powder, major brands such as Hersley, Nestle, and Giardelli, and then some of the uh, more expensive brands, Strust and Navitas. We purchased them nationally, and every product had detectable levels of lead and cadmium. And we noted, as most of us would agree here, that no levels of lead in food are safe. And if you look at all of the products that we tested in the retest, 16 out of 48 products were above a Consumer Reports determined safe level. This level was based on California's standard of maximal allowable dose levels. Um, and uh, each product within that 16 tested uh, for lead and or cadmium uh, before. One of the important things is that we want to inform consumers so that they know how to shop and how to reduce their risk. And we use graphical representations of our results to help them understand the results of, of our testing and our recommendations. So here's an example of our cocoa powder results where you see six different products and the products that are safer, not safe, but safer, um, uh, would be those with the gray bars. And then the two products, Hershey's and Dross Cocoa Powder had red bars because the level of lead that was detected on a per serving basis was above that safe level. What we hope is that consumers would take these results and then shop accordingly to make sure that if they're gonna use these products that they uh, purchase and consume the safest or safer products within our, our, our testing group of, of various brands. So it's empowering the consumers so they can make a difference in their own lives. I also wanted to note um, that we should not forget niche products or products that are said to be more healthy or uh, for specific markets. Um, and don't forget collaborations. Um, 
there are products out there that are purported to be healthier and they are out there for certain markets such as gluten-free offerings, but they may not be so. They may not be safer even if the label says so. Our collaborator, Tamara Rubin of Let's Safe Mama, uh, uh, noted to us that she had some data that certain products with cassava flour as an ingredient actually contain lead. Some of our previous testing, start my video. Uh, some of our previous testing indicated that there could be issues with infant intolerant snack foods. So what we did is we obtained some of these um, cassava containing snack foods, as noted in the picture in the lower left corner, and tested them for lead. The results of our testing were that all of the products that we tested that had cassava flour, flour had lead in them. Lesser Evil's Little Puffs Intergalactic Voyager Veggie Blend actually contained more lead than any other baby product, baby food product that we had tested. An additional, and in addition to informing consumers, an additional advantage to doing this testing and presenting this data, brand level data, is that sometimes you can get manufacturers to withdraw these products off the market. So in June, Lesser Evil announced that they were phasing out all of their products that use cassava flour. And we saw this as a victory because it enabled us to help in some way getting harmful products off the market. The third area that we use our food testing information for is to help change federal regulations. And I should throw in state regulations too. You may be aware of the FDA's Closer to Zero program which was a program that was, that was proposed to set safe or safer regulations and levels of food contaminants for uh, chemical contaminants, including lead. Unfortunately, it's been too long to actually get these regulations in place, but we have contributed our testing data to the FDA, blinded, so they can actually see what products are having issues, at least from our perspective, and taking our data and other testers' data, it would feed into the closer to zero regulations. We are also concerned that the uh, limits that the FDA would try to establish for these foods would be too lenient. And so CR says, Consumer Reports says, the FDA should set mandatory standards for lead and fruit juice of so one parts per billion, for instance, we also note that the levels that we are suggesting are supported by the American Academy of Pediatrics and that other foods should be lower than what Closer to Zero has proposed initially. But we wait to see what the final regulation looks like. One other area that we want is for consumers to participate in getting healthier and safer foods into the market. And so we involve them using petitions for every story that we publish on food. There are links in each story, either on the web or in the magazine, and we advocate them to become partners in change so we can change the food landscape regarding lead and other har harmful chemicals. Um, some of the petitions that uh, we have proposed recently, including um, lead and fruit juice in 2022, um, as a result of our uh, cassava testing, we petitioned the FDA to remove unsafe products from the market. As a result of our chocolate testing, um, there were a number of petitions, including a Valentine's Day theme uh, petition to Hershey's this year. And then because of our findings of lead and sodium in Lunchables, we have petitioned the uh, USDA to remove these products from the school lunch program, which is a, a program that helps provide food to our children um, at lunchtime. And we believe that these products should be removed from that program and also regulated in the market. So in conclusion, what is the usefulness of testing data from a consumer perspective? We try to help consumers make wise and safer choices for shopping so they bring the safest food into their homes that they can. Um, we try to bring pressure on manufacturers to provide safer food choices to consumers, and we enlist the aid of consumers to do so, whether it's voting with their dollars, whether it's petitioning their local legislatures or the federal legislatures. 
And we try to directly influence federal and state regulations to provide safer foods, uh, significantly lower in lead by, again, interacting with them, sharing data, arguing with them that when limits should be lower. If you want any more information, all of our food work is at CR.org. It's in front of the paywall, so it's free. If you're interested in the petitions, here is a link uh, to one of the petitions, more specifically the uh, cassava-based uh, baby, baby products. And if you have any direct uh, questions about methodology or sampling, et cetera, um, I provided my email there too. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Crotchers. That was that was really informative. The whole presentation was really informative. So thank you to all our speakers. We have just a few minutes now for some initial Q and A, um, and I wanted to flag that we have two additional um, authors of the paper with us: Dr. Katie Fellows and Dr. Paramita Hoor. And we already have a few questions in the chat, so. Let me start um, with uh, Kate Porterfield. And the question for you is, is the increased percentage of consumer products as lead, ex <clears throat> as lead exposure um, due to increased research and surveillance strengthening? Do we just know more? Um, or was it relatively low or was it just not initially considered as having been a major source because the focus was on paint and, and gasoline and, you know, the other major sources. Thanks, Karen. Yeah, that's a great question. And it's one that we actually address in the discussion section of our paper. So for people who want to read more, we do encourage you to check that part of it out. We hypothesize that it can be a result of a couple of different factors. The first being that with greater awareness of the potential of lead in consumer products, you can see an increase in identification of those products during home investigations. On the flip side, alternative factors such as resource limitations or limited understanding of those exposures can hamper the identification of those consumer products during the home investigations. So it's a real one, two, the more we know about it, the more awareness we can spread and the more awareness you spread, the more those sources are identified. Thank you. Um, so let me ask, next question goes to uh, Jim Rogers, um, which is about cocoa. Cocoa comes from the tropics, as you said. Uh, the question is, does the lead enter the products in those countries or is it during the value add process uh, while they're being manufactured in the US or Europe? Our research uh, in asking people, number one, learning about the process, but also um, uh, trying to figure out where the lead uh, comes from. Uh, it is our belief that the, the primary contamination of, of cocoa happens during the drying of the beans um, prior to processing, that they may be dried in an area that's either close to a uh, highway where you have cars with leaded gas going by, close to a manufacturing plant that may be using lead in the process. Um, so we think that it's primarily contaminated at the bean stage before there's any grinding or processing mm. later on down the road. Now, we did say that maybe from the machinery, but we don't believe that's the primary source of mm -hmm. contamination. Thank you. Okay, so let's uh, wrap up with um, Paramita. Is there, um, the question is, how can you test for lead? in consumer products before children are exposed, um, and particularly in Mexico. Um, thank you, Karen, and uh, it's nice to be here. Hi to everyone. It's a great question. Uh, I think we, of course, want to prevent. One approach that we have taken in the city is we also do surveillance of New York City store shelves looking for consumer products for purchase, those similar to those that have been perhaps implicated in the literature as potentially lead containing. Uh, so we're con constantly monitoring this. So I think what I'd say is um, if you have that sort of resource to be able to do that, that's one avenue. But one thing that's apparent from our discussions and the review in the paper, many times people may be hand carrying uh, products from abroad being familiar with some of the really uh, the products that have been found to contain really high levels of lead 
when you mentioned Mexico, one of the things we're seeing a lot in the city are the clay, glaze, clay ceramic ware mm -hmm. containing extremely high levels of lead. Uh, at the least, kind of having a sense of who are the users of these, raising their awareness that there is a large potential for lead poisonings or elevated blood lead levels associated with use of these products as seen by other jurisdictions, encouraging blood lead testing. That's something we are routinely doing in the city to try to uh, basically see if some uh, a child is at an increased risk. So various strategies to use uh, to try to hopefully identify the source before the child is even exposed to it. And something else just to throw in there, if there is a source identified as part of a investigation that may be a communal source where other family members may be exposed. So uh, having them also get a blood lead test and uh, really working hard to eliminate that source. I hope that touches or answers your question, Dominica. Thank you. Um... I did see one very quick question, which I think maybe Kate can answer is, have you shared the data with the uh, WHO? Hey, Karen, I can't speak specifically on sharing it with WHO, but as this paper was published last week, it is available for available. sharing. So we'll okay, be able great. to do so on the follow-up. Um, and then I had a request for the uh, PowerPoint presentations themselves. So just wondering if the participants are co comfortable sharing those as well um and you can maybe let 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 us know through the chat that would be great okay so thank you again very very much and let's now um turn to our second presentation which will be um which will be led by our very own drew mccarter who is our uh, pure earth executive director um, he will be joined by Lizeth Alaya, who is a Pure Earth Country Director in Columbia, and Gordon Binkhurst, who's a Senior Technical Director for Pure Earth. Um, and as a reminder for this presentation, we are going to see a cross-country comparison, 25 low- and middle-income countries to understand what lead contamination looks like in consumer products. Um, okay, so Drew, over to you. Thanks, Karen. So we've been talking a lot about uh, lead contamination in products in the United States. Um, our organization works almost exclusively in low income and middle income countries. And of course, we're wildly curious about lead in products in these countries. Um, and so we're going to be, I'm going to be introducing a program that we completed last year that we call rapid market screening. And it tries to answer some of these same questions, uh, you know, across the rest of the world. Um, just very briefly, for so those who are not familiar with Pure Earth, I, I mentioned that we're a U.S.-based nonprofit. We're celebrating our 25th anniversary this year. Um, we do all of our work through about nine country offices and our headquarters in New York with about 100 staff members spread around the world. And the organization's focus is on pollution assessment and surveillance, remediation, policy, education, advocacy, and the like. And again, I mentioned these country offices, it's a pretty good geographic spread around the world. Okay, so the rapid market screening program, we have included it in this webinar, um, even though it was finished last year, because the peer reviewed publication of the findings was just published about two months ago. And if you'd like to find that, just simply Google rapid market screening and the first and second things that pop up will both take you to this publication in the journal Scientific Reports, which I believe is a nature publication. So uh, what is this program? Um, well, we were testing for lead in 25 countries. In those countries, we purchased more than 5,000 consumer items from 11 categories of goods, and that included metal cookware, pots and pans basically, ceramics, that is not only pots and pans, but also cups and bowls and plates and the like, plastic foodware, toys, paints, spices, dried foods, sweets, cosmetics, traditional medicines, and a couple of other things as investigators uh, determined. 
These are the 25 countries. I won't take the time to list them all, but you can see it's a pretty good geographic distribution with a wide variety of cultures and climates and cuisines and hopefully a, a diversity of product types as well. India is shaded like this because we uh, did this program in three Indian states, not the entire country. So our first question that I'm here to answer is why? Why do this? Um, what we had observed is that there had been a number of studies of lead in consumer goods. Mostly they focused on one product type in one country. And so those created kind of a patchwork of information. And from that, it would be very difficult to identify trends or global concerns or to compare what one country is facing versus another country. So we really desired kind of more of a universal protocol that could help us identify such trends and global concerns and hotspots of different issues. So the study had two primary questions. One, what's the geographic distribution of lead concentration in product types that had been identified as sometimes containing lead through previous studies? And how do the concentrations in each product type compare to available regulatory standards or public health guidelines? So how bad is it and where is it basically? Um, so the approach that we took was this. Uh, we developed a uniform protocol to implement the program, which included in each of the 25 countries, investigators going to a handful of major cities, identifying wholesale and uh, retail markets, purchasing items from both of those, then analyzing them in country with a portable handheld XRF analyzer. This is a tool that basically shoots uh, an X-ray at a product and then measures what bounces back to identify the full metal content of that product. Um, and then we sent a subset of these products back to the US for confirmatory testing, both by XRF and in some cases by laboratories here. And then when we got the results, we compared all of these to reference levels. And by reference levels, what we mean is either public health guidelines or regulatory standards. The guidelines were typically from the UN. The regulatory standards we chose were first priority from the EU and second from the US because these are highly resourced regulatory agencies um, that basically spend a lot of money thinking about what levels um, these should be. Here is the list of reference levels we used. For foodware, we could not identify them. So essentially, we used the U.S. Consumer Product Safety Commission's level for children's products. Um, our, my colleague Gordon will talk about um, why 100 ppm might be a relevant or, or not a reference level based on some follow-up testing of cookware. Um, there was uh, quality assurance and quality control that included um, training and oversight of data collection, looking for irregularities. As I mentioned, the retesting of products in New York. Um, and then we ended up expunging data from two countries when these quality control mechanisms showed a deviation between what was measured in the field and what was measured in New York. So one last note before I hand it over to some other colleagues to talk about the findings themselves. Um, it's just how to use and think about this data. We consider this suggestive, not conclusive or representative. Um, and this is not a source apportionment. It cannot sit, tell you that 10% of lead poisoning in country X comes from product one. Um, and the limitations of it are that while it was a very large study, the largest of its type that we're aware of, in each country for each product type, the samples can actually be relatively small, the sample size. Um, also, XRF measurements have a lower detection limit. Sometimes the, re the reference value and the lower detection limit were quite similar. So the XRF has limitations in what it can measure at lower levels. Um, and then, of course, these products are uh, sometimes contain different components. This picture of a toy at the top has obviously an orange plastic part, a white plastic part, and then some metal inside. So there's heterogeneity in the products that is kind of a complication in terms of which, which part of the product do you measure. And with that, I would turn it over to uh, back to Karen and to my colleague Lizette to actually share what we found. Great, thank you. All right, Lizette. Thank you, Karen, thank you, Drew. So please let me know when you see my screen. 
Yeah, that is good. Thank you very much. Uh, so thank you, Drew, for the context and good day to everybody. As you have seen, lead poisoning is still one of the most dangerous and preventable environmental and health threats for children around the world. And as we look into the results, it's important to highlight the great impact that the collective efforts can have in protecting the future generations. So for the results, as Drew mentioned, we analyzed a nearly 5,000 samples around 25 middle, low and middle uh, income countries, and from which 80% of them present high levels of, of the exceeded levels of reference that Drew mentioned. As you may see in the graphic, we analyze metallic and ceramic footwear, paint, toys, cosmetics, and food-like species and sweets. And in the red part of the graphic, you may see the type of product that present the most the highest number of samples with lead contamination that are metallic cookware, ceramic cookware, and paint with above a 51% 50, a and 41% of the samplings showing lead contamination. When we analyze these samples uh, regionally, we can find, we, may, we found that Latin American and the Caribbean has the biggest concern in ceramic footwear and paint for sub-Saharan Africa, the most concerning type of products is metallic footwear. For the Middle East and right North Africa, the most concerning products or the high, the highest number of samples contaminated with lead is ceramic footwear and paint, as well as for Europe and Central Asia. And for South Asia, the most concerning or the most severe contamination is presented in, in metallic footwear. For the East and Asia and Pacific, the paint is the most concerning type of samples that we identify with high level of lead. Going a little bit deeper into the details, uh, for, exa uh, uh, for example, in Colombia, we analyzed 260 samples, and again, 18% of the samples showed a uh, exceeded le re relevant reference level of lead, being metal footwear, ceramic, and paint, as common in, in the other regions and countries, uh, show the high percentage of exceeding reference levels in samples. Nevertheless, we found lead as well in toys and cosmetics. So what is the importance of, of the RMS findings for public health? We want to, or I want to, to highlight three important points. The first one is the magnitude of the childhood lead poison. As you uh, all know, this is a, a high trend for the childhood um, health in, regarding neurological effects in long term. The scale of the problem around the world is really concerning, and the impact in low and middle income countries is uh, high, is really of high concern. Second of all, the sources of exposure and their variability. As we uh, see in the results of the, of the research, there is a diversity of sources, not just uh, between countries, but, am but among the same country, and the common contaminated products that we find in the results. Third, and last but not least, the contamination in cooking utensils and food. As we saw, the metal and ceramic cookware utensils, 52% of the samples uh, present a, most, a, a high level of lead, uh, above 100 parts per million of lead, and the lead release that could be um, get from the from the samples. It is important to highlight as well that, as Drew was mentioning, as not all of the number of samples were representative. It is important for the countries and countries uh, are, as Colombia to go deeper into that did kind that kind of research, and to be able to provide this data to the uh, decision makers in order to put the more the most concerning uh, sources of lead exposure in the regulation and in the public policy to prioritize those, source, those sources and protect uh, the health of the general population, especially shield. What are the public uh, health recommendations that we that arise from these results? First of all, if they is the going deeper into the research, and know better about most sources and how are the most concerning ones, and the relationship between the content of lead, the direct content or the total content of lead, and how this can be released uh, along the time. Recommend to the regulators to establish a very low uh, limits of lead in the products, in the consumer products. As we all know, there is no a safe uh, le le level uh, for these kind of products. 
and to make them guarantee that if there is lead in the products, that is going to no, not going to be released for the common use or the normal use of these products. There could be some interventions in high concentration child areas. This means schools or daycares, as in this kind of places, it could be used, they utilize the, the food uh, cookware that can have high levels of lead. And this could be a, a easy, quickly intervention that maybe have a, a low cost. Unless the need for two coordinated and targeted actions to identify and mitigate lead exposure in all levels. As a final message, I will uh, want to highlight that data serve as a crucial tool for policymakers in order to pursue risk mitigation regarding the exposure to lead and the consequences in long term that have for the childhood health. The acknowledgement, a great acknowledgement to all of the people and the contributors to participate in this study, their unwavering support and continued efforts, as well Keep our commitment from here all of uh, our team around the world to firmly uh, reduce global lead pollution and do all of all of efforts in, in this pursuing. And we invite everyone here to join us in disseminating these findings, actively participating in implementing strategies to reduce lead exposure worldwide. And we are pretty sure uh, we have a, a great hope that together we can make a great, a significant impact and create safer and healthier environments for our child, for our children. Thank you, Karen. Thank you. Thanks very much, especially for your call to action there at the end. Um, okay, so over to our, our final presenter. Hi, Gordon, we can see you. <clears throat> Uh, Sarah, I believe Sarah is going to be sharing our slides. Yep, and here we go. Yep. And here we go. So good day and welcome everybody. Uh, today we've already heard a, about a lot of lead sources uh, for exposure to our world's children. Uh, today I'm just going to focus on aluminum pots and pans predominantly, um, pots such as the ones you see in the uh, figure before you. So our next slide. Uh, as we, as Liz asked and Drew mentioned, our rapid market screening, uh, as part of that, we collected 500 metallic foodware items. These things included spoons, uh, utensils, uh, cups, bowls, what have you, um, but it also included aluminum pots and pans, which is going to be the focus today. Uh, why? Because, uh, you know, cooking food in an aluminum pot has a much higher exposure potential than, say, a plate with a piece of toast on it. So very different. Um, so the next slide, please. So what did we find in terms of the just the aluminum cookware, meaning the actual pots and pans? We found a lot of lead uh, levels ranging from a few parts per million all the way till I think our highest was about 13,000 parts per million lead. Uh, that's total lead in the aluminum cookware. Um, not only did we find surprisingly high levels in the aluminum cookware, as has been suggested from many other studies, uh, but it was very ubiquitous. We found it in literally every, all of the 25 countries that we conducted our rapid market survey in. So not only were the levels quite high, they were pretty much everywhere. Uh, the next slide. So we understand that there's a lot of total lead in these aluminum pots, but then we have to ask ourselves, what's the exposure potential from these aluminum pots? How much is actually going to leach into the food uh, that we are potentially ingesting. And in order to do that, we had to take a step further beyond the scope of the RMS study and do leaching testing of the aluminum pots and pans. And we took uh, approximately 102 pots and pans for leachate testing at a laboratory, which you, you can see in the picture on the right. Uh, essentially, our leachate testing took acetic acid, which is essentially like a vinegar, and boiled it in the pot for two hours. And then we collect a sample of the leachate and test it for lead concentration. And this lead concentration is you know, representative of what might be in, say, a tomato sauce that you are cooking. Why a tomato sauce? Because uh, it's just, uh, very acidic, similar to an acetic acid. It is a, probably a fairly aggressive leaching technique compared to, say, you know, uh, boiling rice in water, for example. 
in, in this instance, you know, the, the pot you see is from India. It had a total lead concentration of about 900 parts per million. And the leachable lead that we found uh, in the laboratory leachate testing was approximately 60 parts per billion. Now, just to give you a frame of reference, we'll, which we'll be talking about, the WHO drinking water standard is about 10 parts per billion. So this is significantly higher uh, than a drinking water standard. We could have our next slide, please. Uh, this represents the results of all 102 pots that we leached. Uh, so there's a quite a range of total lead ranging from a few parts per million, like I said, up to 13,000. Uh, and the levels of leachable lead uh, were from below detection limits of approximately one part per billion, uh, with the highest concentration of almost 3,000 parts per billion of lead in the, in the leachate. Um, so quite concerning concentrations of lead as compared to, say, a reference level of 10 parts per billion, which again is a drinking water standard. Um, what you'll also see in this graph is there's a lot of variability. There, there is a reasonable linear relationship between total lead and leachable lead, but there's also a lot of spread in the data. Keep in mind, this is a log log plot as well. But you can say for any total lead concentration of say a thousand, you can see leachable lead concentrations ranging from below 10 to well into the several hundreds of parts per billion. So there's reasons for this, uh, which are complicated, and we'll, we'll touch on them a little bit, uh, but they, they range from how we measure the total lead conversation, concentration to different manufacturing techniques, how the lead might be distributed in the aluminum, different heating and tempering histories of each pot and pan. Uh, so these are all of the pots and pans. Um, so there is quite a, a spread, but it is understandable uh, in some degrees. Uh, we also found that total lead of less than about 100 parts per million is a, a pretty good indication that the pot will not leach above our reference level of 10 parts per billion. Um, and why do we say this? Because of the 20 pots that we tested, 19 of them uh, had a, a leachable lead of less than 10. Now, there are other studies that have tested other you know, pots with, say, 50 or 20 parts per million of total lead and found above 10 parts per billion. But th these are the results of our study. Uh, and again, it's not to say that less than 10 parts per billion in the leachate or less than 100 ppm total lead is safe by any stretch. Uh, these are just sort of reference or screening values uh, to try to uh, figure out which, which pots are most at risk at, at creating significant exposure. Uh, if we could have the next slide. So we talk about impact, we talk about import, uh, apportionment among sources. Ultimately, all of this uh, relates to blood lead levels. Um, so how do these leachate findings uh, relate to blood lead levels? Uh, we use the US EPA's IUBK model to estimate what the resultant blood lead levels might look like from ingesting food that is represented by the range of leachate concentrations that we found. Uh, and Jack Caravanos at NYU helped us with, with the, the modeling work. Um, and you can see there's quite a range. And even at our reference level of 10 parts per billion, uh, where the green arrow is, we see a blood level impact of almost half a microgram per deciliter, uh, which is significant. Um, and at our highest concentration of 3,000 uh, parts per billion, uh, it's almost 50 micrograms per deciliter, which most doctors would you know, recommend chelation therapy for. So, the, so there's quite a range of potential impacts that we're seeing uh, over the pots that we tested, all of which are significant. Um, so that, that's, again, quite concerning. Uh, and I will say uh, a little asterisk here is that most of the leaching studies that we and other researchers, including Katie Fellows on this call, um, use acetic acid, which is fairly aggressive. And it's probably, well, not probably, it is more aggressive than, say, boiling rice in water. Uh, so these are sort of worst case, I would say. Um, and they would vary depending on each of the food that you, each food type that you might cook, how much is ingested. Again, this modeling is 250 grams of food every day at a concentration represented by acetic acid. Okay, so I, th I think there's several items in there that are probably overestimating the actual exposure, um, but we'll get to that as well. So next slide, please. 
So before re reviewing just some of our more substantive findings, I wanted to share a visual with you is what is going on uh, as we subject these pots to acetic acid. Um, and these are, these are scanning electron microscopy um, photos of cross sections of some representative pots. Uh, the two A and B ones are brand new pots and C is a used pot from India. Uh, the two on the bottom uh, were formed from sheets of aluminum, so rolled aluminum stock. And you can see that there's a definite microstructure present there. Um, the lighter gray is the actual aluminum and all of the darker gray little dots you see are impurities, including silicates, iron, and of course, lead, okay? The top pot is cast, um, meaning that it was formed from molten aluminum poured in a sand cast. And like I said, the two bottom ones were from rolled aluminum. Um, you can see very different patterns of attack. Uh, the acetic acid is literally attacking the aluminum in very specific areas, and it is burrowing down and quite deeply in the case of the used pot from India. So how much lead is leaching out, to these, out of these pots is also a function of this, the mechanics of this. Uh, is the acetic acid coming into contact with environmentally accessible lead? Okay, so this is just one of the complexities. Uh, if I could have the next slide. So again, our findings of a reasonable linear relationship between total and leachable lead. Um, heating is a very important factor. I didn't share with you, but we um, took acetic acid in some of these pots and left it sitting there for days and collected sample every few hours and then every day. Uh, and the numbers didn't change very much. And there were orders of magnitude lower than when we boiled the acetic acid for two hours. Um, it can be in a significant exposure source with modeled blood lead levels of almost 50 micrograms per deciliter. Again, with the caveat that this is a relatively aggressive technique in evaluating these pots. Um, amongst the pots we tested, uh, the results definitely varied by area, um, but the highest were definitely from South and Southeast Asia. Um, of course, with any, any of these things that we're studying, there's always much more work uh, to be done uh, to sort of understand the factors and mechanisms of how this lead is leaching out of the aluminum uh, and how it relates total lead to leachable lead. Uh, comparison, as I just mentioned, you know, compare, comparing laboratory leaching methodology to real food and actual exposure. Uh, so, you know, the, the leaching we do in the laboratory with acetic acid, again, is more conservative probably than actual exposure. And then the supply chain, uh, how the lead is getting in there where the scrap metal is coming from, which of course includes things like engine blocks, uh, where the ingots are formed, uh, to the pots that show up in the marketplace and ultimately are winding up in people's kitchens. And understanding that, that supply chain can help us uh, address the, how the lead is getting in and how to get it out. Um, so the next slide. Uh, so, you know, Pure Earth also has formed a working group, uh, lead and cookware working group, and I'm sure somebody will put it in the chat, but that is the link to the, uh, our webpage. Uh, and these are the different um, people and universities, etc., who are in the working group, helping to study some of the questions I raised and bring, uh, bring this study forward uh, towards better understanding um, and better you know, monitoring and regulation and getting lead out of aluminum cookware and from being a potential exposure source. And next slide. Uh, and these are just some of the areas we're working on, uh, understanding, you know, everything from a total XRF measurement of a pot to blood lead level analysis and everything in between. Um, we do have a school lunchware program in Ghana, Indonesia, and India. Uh, where we are looking at food cooked in aluminum pots that are being served to the students uh, compared to food cooked in stainless steel pots, ostensibly without lead in them, uh, and trying to see what the addition of the aluminum cookware it is. Uh, and we're doing that control simply because uh, there's can be lead in the raw ingredients as well, which we're also testing. Uh, but again, looking at supply chain, looking at the regulatory framework with how we can empower people to get the lead out um, and refining the aluminum potentially to, and 
Again, this becomes difficult because a lot of the aluminum cookware is made in more artisanal settings. Uh, is there something they can add to the aluminum stock to prevent or reduce or mitigate the leaching of lead uh, when exposed to food? So I think that is the end of my presentation. Um, I'm sure there's lots of questions. Uh, most of what I discussed will be coming out in the publication, um, hopefully shortly, I'm still working on it. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Gordon. Um, we do indeed have a few questions um, and one for each of you guys. So let me start with you, Gordon. Um, so the question is that why is it there is not or does not appear to be a linear relationship between the um, concentration of leaching and average um, blood lead levels? So it's, it's a relationship between total and leachable lead? I believe. Uh, leach they concentration and average blood lead levels. Well, if I have a I have a graph of it. I believe it um, it's one of uptake, uh, and I'd have to go back to the IEBK model to figure out exactly why it's not exactly a linear relationship. Okay. Um, then for uh, Lizeth, what do the regulations in Colombia um, and Latin America broadly say about these findings in public health? And I actually had a related question: is um, particularly in Colombia. Uh, are these findings generating any kind of, of action? Thank you, Karen. Indeed, for Colombia, there is a previous regulation from these studies from 2022. Uh, the, the, is the law uh, 2041. And for this law, it is still uh, is mandatory for the country to regulate the, the levels of lead content in some products. Just for a, a brief uh, reading of this, it is prohibited to import, manufacture, commercialization of products as toys, for example, these the solid products that could be in, in touch, uh, the, the, in contact with children, is prohibited to all of those activities exceeding 90 uh, parts per million of toys, as well for architectural uh, paints in 90, per, 90 parts per million as well piping, fittings, all of the installation and repair of pipes, as well that can the, that can uh, give concentrations to are exceeding uh, five milligrams per liter of water, uh, 0 0.0005 milligrams per liter, and as well for all of the domestical imported or produced agricultural inputs uh, here in livestock in Colombia. So this is a previous regulation. What we are waiting and pursuing is with these results to share with the government as well for another uh, initiatives and projects regarding uh, broad levels here that are going to be testing here in Colombia for the coming year uh, in order to provide this data for the, for the country. Because this law is still in force, but there is a lack of technical regulation and all of the technical uh, instructions for keep this in force. So we are hoping that sharing these results will pursue this kind of, of action in the in the government matters. Great, thank you. Um, okay, so Drew, one person asked, um, how can this be practiced in Zambia? I, I, think, I think they mean the rapid market screening. So maybe you could explain that and then um, respond to the question about whether anyone is studying lead and consumer products in Europe. Sure, I'll start with the second one. And first I wanna specify that I'm not an expert in European domestic surveillance programs. So I'll just share my general impressions. And that is first that I find that Europe is pretty conservative around setting regulatory standards, generally favoring the precautionary principle, which is to make sure that something is safe before it's released rather than kind of releasing it and then checking if it's dangerous. Um, and I assume that Europe does some fairly robust product testing. But surprisingly, what European countries don't do as much of as, say, the United States does, is test blood among their citizens. Um, there, from our research, there is actually very little blood testing going on. Not none, certainly, but comparatively little. And that means that I suspect they are missing some things that we would catch in the US, for example, there was this big recall of applesauce in the United States. And that recall was not enacted because we caught contaminated applesauce through product testing. We identified lead poison kids and then did the research to figure out what was poisoning them. And that led us to the applesauce. So if Europe isn't testing kids, they're probably missing 
a key part of surveillance. Um, regarding Zambia, replicating the rapid market screening project could be very easy. The one challenge is the expense of these XRF machines. These machines often cost around $30,000. And if you don't use them, then you need to hire a laboratory, which can also be quite expensive. So the one hurdle that we need to make cheaper and easier to replicate this and to scale this up is the cost of these tools primarily. Great, thank you so much. Um, all right, well, I think we are now going to move on to our final presentation. Um, and here we're going to be looking at the <clears throat> relative um, health impacts of 16 chemical pollution pollutants, including lead. So let's go ahead and uh, turn this over to Dr. Jack Caravanos, who's a clinical professor of environmental public health services at NYU School of Global Public Health and the author of the paper on this issue. Over okay, you. thank you, Karen, and mm -hmm. <clears throat> greetings, everybody. Let me uh, pull up the presentation. Okay, hopefully you can see all this. Very good. Yep, so good. <laughs> again, this paper is sort of summarizing some of the, uh, the investigation uh, using a sort of a different approach. And it's called Structured Expert Judgment, uh, SEJ, SEJ. And it's actually been around for a while. And it's my first time working with this. I did not do the analysis. I was a, a participant in the research team, but I, uh, I was not uh, uh, the one analyzing the data. This is the uh, article. It's, it's open access. You could look it up uh, yourself on PLOS One. And I believe we'll be distributing many of these articles. And I would just want to say that when you when you want information, there's many ways of getting it. Uh, obviously, numerical data from the agencies is very useful. Uh, but we have been using panels in many, many ways. I mean, this is really more commentators. Are these really experts? But very often, you know, we'll get a group of experts, and it's very common in sports. Uh, these people live and, and die with uh, football or basketball or soccer. So they generally know more than the average person and can analyze. Uh, they're not perfect, but if you put enough of them together, together you'll probably get something of a, a consensus there. We also see this in annual meetings in Davos, where you have a panel of economists uh, talking together, sharing ideas on world economy. And this is sort of uh, an expert judgment uh, determination. And of course, board of directors, that's how they work. Uh, most of the people on the board of directors have some knowledge of the com particular company or the product that they're involved in. So the more people you get involved in this, sort of the more accurate and the more inclusive the whole process is. So what's really important is if we were to ask UNEP uh, UNEP, uh, 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 Jeff, or World Health Organization, or even World Bank, what is your your um, uh, priority in any particular time of the year? It's going to change. And it's wrong to think that all these agencies are chasing just one chemical. They have agendas, and they have ministers. Uh, World Health Organization is really run by ministers of many of these countries, so they have agendas. So that if you're frustrated, why is it that UNEP says one thing, uh, FDA says another level, consumer products says another level, uh, and you're wondering, can't these people get, get along? But again, they all have different, um, I don't want to say agendas, but ultimately it's bi a bias. So here's how the process works. We uh, first identify experts, and it could be a very narrow group. In this particular case, it was experts in, in the global burden of disease people that sort of live day to day with these numbers, then we have to sort of validate their expertise. And this is a calibration effort, uh, uh, effort whereby you ask people, uh, what do you think is the number one cause of death in childhood mortality in, in US? And if you say something like skateboarding accidents, you know, you're probably gonna be excluded because you're way off. So the whole idea of validating expertise is really showing that the people do know uh, this particular topic. And of course, then you present them questions and ultimately you use a statistical analysis, and I'll go over that in a little while, 
So this is not just a series of, of I say this, you say that. Okay, let's agree on this particular uh, course of action. By the way, this is not new. Uh, the Delphi method, named after the uh, oracle at Delphi, where you, people would go for knowledge, uh, tell me what's going on. Uh, the Delphi method is very common in social sciences. And um, and while not as, well, I shouldn't say, I was going to say not as analytical, um, it's uh, social science where you're asking opinions and comments can get very soft. So in this particular case, uh, it's not it's not a statistical, but again, it's it's been used many many times. Um, obviously, why do you use it? Combines expertise, reduces bias, improves accuracy, and most important, it really can help decision making. Uh, too often in our business, whoever yells the loudest gets the the agenda, gets the table, gets the funding, and this is a way to really equalize that whole process. Um, and by the way, all of this is sort of covered in the paper, so I encourage you to at least uh, skim it. How did it work? Nine experts were chosen. A bunch of numerical va values were, uh, variables were asked of them, or 16 different chemicals. And these are the chemicals on the left. PW stands for performance weight. So if I were to say, hey, how, how many people a year are dying of asbestos? Uh, now, if you're an asbestos epidemiologist, you're 95% sure probably that you have a pretty solid answer. If you never deal in this topic, you're probably going to come up with a different number. So not only are, did they ask us what is your number, but they said, how sure are you of this number? And we each had to answer all three of these uh, confidence intervals of sorts for each of the chemicals. And... Um, and why these chemicals? Well, that was part of the, uh, many of these chemicals are dominating the news um, uh, today and, and in the past. And what you see in front of you is the actual uh, number of deaths for, uh, for these chemicals. You see, uh, we report in most of the paper, the 50% performance weight. So you see lead, 1.66 million people are dying of lead poisoning. Um, a year, and you could sort of process this in uh, in some spare time because I, I can't go over every single number here. But you see, some are definitely standing out: uh, asbestos, arsenic, lead, uh, really does stand out, and uh, highly uh, hazardous uh, products, pollutants. Okay, here's the uh, here it is as a graph here, and this is where I want to spend a minute. Notice how small the uh, the bar graph is for phthalates for PFAS, for endocrine disruptors. Uh, these are hot topics in our field of environmental health, but when you really look at how toxic are they and how um, a combination of how much we know about their toxicity and how much we know about their um, exposure, it's uh, quite low. So this is very revealing um, in our field because we're, I have a lot of colleagues who are chasing down plastics in the ocean. And what's the public health significance? Well, that's that's nowhere on here, right? Because uh, it's such a small impact. But it's an environmental science impact, not an environmental health. Okay, here's the numbers in DALIs. Uh, DALIs are a, a universal measure of uh, sort of equalizing uh, public health uh, impact. Um, and it because some of these chemicals cause body damage while other chemicals cause mortality. And DALIs is a way to sort of equalize all that. In addition, we were asked, how big of a problem do you see this in high-income countries and low-income countries? And for asbestos, 40% uh, um, of the uh, the prevalence of how important is this was in the uh, low-income, um, low and middle-income countries. But then we also were asked, um, how solid is the health effect data on asbestos? Meaning, are we sure that this is toxic material? Do we have enough uh, toxicological studies, epidemiological studies to really know something about this compound? And for asbestos, it is quite high, 43%, the data is adequate. Then the second part is, how much do we know about who is exposed to asbestos? And this, uh, this becomes very revealing when we look at some of these numbers. So on the left, you have some chemicals, and I have three uh, 
pages of these numbers. And again, you'll get a copy of this so you could look around. Uh, you see right away benzene. We have a lot of solid, good old data on benzene. We know it's a leukemogen. We know how it affects the body. Uh, any toxicologist would say, hey, benzene, we don't have to do more tox studies. Uh, whereas arsenic is not quite there. And uh, cadmium, 60% is inadequate uh, for the health effects. So this is really uh, sort of marching um, a mandate for uh, funding NIH to give funding to study uh, what's going on with chromium-6 in um, low and middle income countries. You see 92% of that is in middle income countries. Um, of course, lead stands out tremendously, and, uh, and that's why you're tuning in today. Um, we have a lot of good data on lead. We know the toxic effects. We're actually learning more that this is now a more important effect at lower levels. That's why there's so much attention today, is we're finding the, the cognitive damage is occurring at a very low level, something we never thought of. Um, and also, we do have a lot of uh, current knowledge about exposure. Uh, but other chemicals, uh, 80, uh, highly hazardous pollutants, pesticides, for example, 88% inadequate data on who is exposed. So again, when you match that up with the column on the right with low and middle income countries, you see a whole new agenda that needs to uh, maybe be um, implemented. Okay, and again, more data here on phthalates, uh, endocrine disruptors, and brominated flame retardants, and PFAS. Um, all right, so let me just wrap up and say that the overall conclusion is that these three, these four chemicals dominate far more. So these are a panel of nine toxicologists, environmental health scientists that sort of concluded this. And by the way, the, the results of 5%, 50%, 95% are put into an analytical um, a modeling program and, um, and processed accordingly. The more people we had, the tighter that you know, distribution would be. It would be just a much narrower distribution. Um, however, the goal here is to really create more structured expert panels on different topics. For example, food and lead uh, contamination prevalent. Lead alone is 1.7. Interestingly enough, uh, this is a widely quoted number where you know, the people that participated in this uh, came pretty close with, but Lancet is now um, coming out and, and, and uh, World Bank uh, closer to 5 million. So, um, so that one problem is these multilateral environmental agreements exist for only some of these chemicals. And sometimes they're not even the important ones, but they're the hot ones of the day, the contaminant du jour of sorts. And lastly, uh, highly political, Priorities, uh, everybody's concerned about PFAS, uh, these uh, forever chemicals. What a, what a genius phrase, a forever chemical, uh, a beautiful marketing ploy. But when you consider the relative health impact to humans uh, all over the planet, it's low. Uh, phthalates, endocrine disruptors, nasty compounds, but we still don't know that much about uh, total mortality there. So I'm happy that you know, I'm part of an effort to really encourage um, uh, uh, more investigation in the area of lead, which is something we have not uh, solved completely. Uh, thank you very much, everybody. Uh, I'll be around to take some questions. Uh, please look up the article, uh, read it. It's fascinating and uh, wish you the best of luck. Thank you so much for that. <laughs> it was really informative. Um, okay, so we are getting close to the end of our time. Um, I have a, a couple of questions. So one is actually uh, back to the issue of metallic cookware, it's for KB fellows. Um, and the question is, have you found that any particular kind of metallic cookware or any component uh, is more likely to contain lead or have highable, higher leachable lead content? Um, so that's the first part of the question. And then the second is, how has Washington state succeeded in passing legislation to ban lead contaminated metal cookware? So okay. Katie, are you still there? I am here, can you hear me? Yes, there we are. I can see you too, excellent, thank you. Great. 
Um, yeah, so I can I can speak to the research that we did in King County, um, where you know we tested about a hundred items of cookware. Um, those include aluminum, brass, and stainless steel. Um, and we did not necessarily see that any particular type of cookware contained more lead over another. Um, but to get to your point, uh, your uh, part of your question about components, we did notice that many times on uh, pressure cookers, the uh, valve stems for uh, releasing pressure in those um, are often made of a different type of metal. So even like a stainless steel pressure cooker may contain a uh, pressure relief valve that is not stainless steel, is, is maybe something like brass, which is our guess based on some of the XRF data. Um, and these can then often, you know, lead is often added to brass. Um, so these will often have uh, much higher levels of lead in those components compared to the rest of the cookware. And while something on the lid is not necessarily in constant contact with the food, uh, which would definitely uh, increase the amount of lead that leaches from it, it may still contribute to the lead that's found in food um, just because you know, there's a lot of condensation and steam. Um, and so some of that may be dripping back down into the food, but it is, you know, significantly less um, leaching of lead from those compared to uh, parts of the cookware that is in const constant contact with food. Oh, and then your, uh, that, the second question about uh, passing legislation in Washington, yes. Um, we were, uh, were lucky to have great support from our legislators in Washington um, who put together a bill um, that was recently passed uh, that limited the amount of lead found um, in cookware to, I believe, five parts per million. Um, you know, we were very lucky that this bill passed during, you know, its first uh, go through the legislative system. So, um, I can speak, I don't, <laughs> I'm not the policy expert for our program, um, but uh, yeah, that's that's what, what recently happened. Thank you. Okay, so look, in the interest of time, I want to turn this back over to Drew with a, with a final question, but I did want to thank everybody first. Those were um, terrific, really well done PowerPoint, succinct, really interesting new research. So, um, so thank you so much. Drew, as I turn this over to you, um, there's a question, quite a broad question. What policy strategies are recommended for countries, agencies, communities, and families? Obviously, you could spend another hour and a half on that alone, but perhaps as you wrap up, um, you could touch on that. Uh, thank you again, everybody. Thanks, Karen. You know, one challenge that we observe, particularly in low income and middle income countries, is that uh, ministries of health and environment, um, because there haven't been previous investments in this type of assessment, they lack a lot of data around exposure sources, exposure levels, the geographic distribution of exposure. They just lack data that would help those agencies make a strong justification to have a, a more robust budget to do this type of work. So without good data, you can't make a strong justification. If you don't have a strong justification, you're unlikely to get a stronger budget in your ministerial budget in the future. And without the budget, you can't go back and collect data. And you're kind of stuck in this circular loop. No data, no justification, no budget. So a lot of the work we try to do, the, you know, some of the work that we saw here today is to try to, from an external, as an external actor, try to feed in a little bit of data um, to kind of break this circle. This circle. Um, now, it does not require, certainly does not require international partners to do this type of assessment. So to the extent that any national government recognizes that all around the pe world, people are waking up to the urgency of this. For them to start investing in domestic surveillance of blood and products and environmental media would be, I think, an even more important way to break this cycle. Um, ultimately, these challenges will be solved by national, provincial, and uh, municipal governments. They won't be solved by international nonprofits and development agencies. So together, I think the first step is just to try to break this cycle by adding data into the mix. 
That's without going into it for an hour. I think that's my top level take on that. And then Karen, I'm going to take the opportunity to share some final closing thoughts here as well. First, Karen, I want to thank you for doing a brilliant job as always moderating here. Same to our esteemed speakers and all of the thoughtful questions from our participants. Thank you all. I think these three studies all speak to a common theme, which is the urgency to answer remaining questions to build better surveillance and data sharing platforms. Um, the, the authors of the four US jurisdiction study suggested that the US could benefit from a better data uh, retrieval, collection and retrieval system that was national. Um, and of course we need to invest in solutions. With that as context, a few key points. Funding, all this work costs money. Today, the best estimates are that as a globe, we spend about $15 million internationally trying to solve this problem. I believe it costs more to paint a bridge in my city than that. So an absolutely paltry sum we're spending on an issue that, you know, the lower range of the estimates in terms of economic cost is a trillion dollars annually, and the upper end of the estimates is six trillion. And here we are spending 15 million on it annually. Um, so we just urge anyone with the capability to invest in this issue. Second, as a with now a global economy, we can't predict protect citizens through domestic efforts alone. The U.S. can't pr protect U.S. citizens just by internal domestic monitoring. These products cross borders constantly, and we need to invest in solutions at the source of production. It means it's a global effort now. It can't just be a domestic effort. And then finally, scale. The type of work that Pure Earth does is small in comparison to the nature of the challenge. We're in a handful of countries working with some thousands of people, um, you know, thousands or hun maybe hundreds of communities. But we, this is a global problem and we need to scale up all of this type of work by making it simpler and cheaper. You can't solve this problem globally at the current expense of these types of things. We need to be able to test blood more cost effectively. We need to be able to test products more cost effectively. So we need massive investments in making assessment tools cheaper um, and simpler. So I'll leave it there. In closing, I just wanna thank everyone who's participated again. Please stay in touch with Pure Earth. Our social media handles are at Pure Earth now. Um, our website is pureearth.org. Please reach out to us with any remaining questions at info at pureearth.org. And once again, thank you all for joining us.